Long Island Sound. Many of us have heard of this body of water. Perhaps some of us have even gone fishing here or boating. Others surely have swum in it. Driving in our cars, we've passed it many times and perhaps not known that it was Long Island Sound that we were seeing. But did you ever wonder about Long Island Sound? Just what is Long Island Sound anyway? Where is it? Has it always been there? Why does the shoreline look the way it does? And what about the bottom? What does that look like? This program will answer these questions about this mighty body of water right in our neighborhood. Long Island Sound. Where in the world is Long Island Sound? On the continent of North America is the United States of America. The eastern coast of the United States is bordered by the Atlantic Ocean. On the northern portion of this coastline is a large island, Long Island which lies along the coasts of the states of New York and Connecticut. The body of water between Long Island and these states is Long Island Sound. A sound is a body of water which forms a channel between the mainland and an island. That is why it's called Long Island Sound and it is one of the largest coastal bodies of water in the United States. Long Island Sound is 110 miles or 178 kilometers from east to west. The western boundary is generally considered to be Throgs Neck, which is spanned by the Throgs Neck Bridge. The sound is its narrowest here with a width of only a half mile or 0.8 kilometers. At its widest point in the central region, the sound is 21 miles across or 34 kilometers. The eastern boundary of the sound is marked off by a small chain of islands perched between deep submerged channels. These islands include Plum Island, Great Gull Island, and Fisher's Island. This eastern boundary of the sound is often referred to as the race because of the fast current created by the incoming and outgoing tides. The tides which surge through here exchange water between Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound, and the Atlantic Ocean. The Sound also exchanges water with the Atlantic Ocean at its western end through the East River and New York, New Jersey Harbor. Because of this close tidal relationship, Long Island Sound is considered an arm of the Atlantic Ocean. To get to know Long Island Sound better, let's take an aerial tour around its coastline. The tour will start right in the middle of the north shore of Long Island. Head west toward New York City. Travel northeast along the Connecticut coastline to Fisher's Island. Across the race, back to Long Island, and then southwest back to where the tour began. The tour of the northern coastline of Long Island begins at Conscience Bay, a small bay with a narrow mouth about halfway between the western and eastern boundaries of the Sound. 
Traveling further along the Long Island coastline, we see the first indications of the towering sand bluffs that are found all along the coast. Some of these bluffs rise up more than 100 feet above the beach. These bluffs are just outside of Smithtown Harbor. The prominent Lilco smokestacks at the Northport Power Plant stand in the foreground of Huntington Bay. Huntington Bay has four harbors extending from it to further inland, Northport, Centerport, Huntington, and Lloyd Harbors. These harbors are about 10,000 years old, which is actually quite young geologically speaking. They are the result of sea level slowly rising to flood the coastal lowlands. These spits of land near the mouth of these harbors were slowly crafted over time with sand deposited by the relentless force of waves and the tides. As the shoreline of Long Island was formed and is now forming, sheltered harbors and long stretches of beaches attracted people to the coast. As we travel westward, the shoreline here shows the signs of this increase in human population. Here is the majestic Throgs Neck Bridge, which represents the western end of Long Island Sound. On the northern side of the Sound, we pass Westchester County, New York. Soon we begin to witness the many and varied harbors of Connecticut. Connecticut has many more harbors than Long Island. This is because of massive glaciers, which when slowly moving across this land many thousands of years ago, gouged out deep impressions in what is now Connecticut. Traveling further eastward, we come to the Norwalk Islands. People are often surprised to know that there are islands in Long Island Sound. These islands are the remnants of the great movements of earth and ice which helped form Long Island Sound. We now come to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport shows signs of the industry along the coast of the Sound. The growth of industry here was made possible by many geologic features of the Sound. The harbors are deep enough to accommodate shipping. The harbors are also protected from storms, and the sound itself is protected from the high wind and waves that pound the coastline facing the ocean. Traveling further east along the Connecticut coastline, we encounter a large, marshy area. Tidal wetlands such as these are created by the slow buildup of sediment and organic matter, a process which can span many human lifetimes. About two-thirds of the way along the Connecticut coast of the Sound, we encounter the mouth of the Connecticut River. From the air, one can see how the silty fresh water from the river is mixing with the salt water of Long Island Sound. From our perspective, it also becomes apparent just how rocky the Connecticut coastline is far rockier than the Long Island shore. Geologists see this as a clue to learning how the sound was originally formed. We now travel back across the sound to the Long Island coast and begin to travel west again. From Orient Point on the eastern tip of the north shore of Long Island back to Conscience Bay, where our tour began. There is a virtually unbroken stretch of sandy shoreline. This creates some of the finest beaches on the Sound. More of the sand bluffs can be found here as well. The top layer of this bluff is the Harbor Hill Moraine, deposited here by a glacier and now eroded by the relentless action of the wind, rain and waves. Conscience Bay once again, and a return to that snug harbor from which we began our tour.
We've now seen what the coastline of Long Island Sound looks like, but it's easy to forget about the bottom of Long Island Sound because it's out of our sight. But the bottom has a fascinating character all its own. The trick is to see what's down there, and for that, we'll need some special instruments. Leaving from Port Jefferson Harbor is the Onrust, the research vessel of the Marine Sciences Research Center at the University at Stony Brook. With the help of some local students, geologists will be using special instruments to record the contour and the composition of the bottom. A photometer sends high-frequency sound waves that bounce off the bottom and return to the ship. The readings give geologists a picture of the contour of the bottom. To learn about the composition of the bottom sediments, geologists can take a grab sample to gather a sample of the sediment floor. This is a core sampler. Dropped to the bottom of the sound, a core sampler drills through the surface to extract a cylinder-shaped sample from beneath the floor of the sound. Each layer of mud represents a period of time where sediment was deposited on the bottom. So the deeper one samples into the mud, the further back in time one can look at the composition and character of the bottom of the sound. This is a rocky segment of the bottom near New Rochelle, New York. Throughout the sound, the bottom is a constantly changing landscape. Sand is relentlessly shifting, being picked up by the current in one area and deposited in another. This creates shoaling, or the buildup of sand and sediment. When shoals build up in the bays and harbors of the sound, they can become a hazard to navigation, so they must be dredged using machines such as this bucket dredger. Though the contour of the bottom is constantly changing, there are some prevailing characteristics which make this terrain far different from what we see on shore. Extending away from the coastal beaches are large blankets of sand. All across the eastern sound, there are long stretches of sand with large ridges and underwater dunes, almost like the dunes of a desert. Even more surprising, in the central and western regions of the Sound, there are vast tracts of silty mud. There is nothing at all like this on the land surrounding the Sound. The bottom of Long Island Sound has been divided into three general areas. The western region, the central region, and the eastern region. These regions are transected by long submerged ridges called sills. The Hempstead Sill extends from Matinecock Point to the New York-Connecticut boundary. The Mattituck Sill stretches from the Mattituck Inlet on the north shore of Long Island to near the mouth of the Connecticut River. As we can see in this side view of the sound, the Mattituck Sill is the largest submerged ridge in the Sound. Maximum depth over it is only 80 feet or 24 meters, whereas just to the east of this sill, the Sound can be as deep as 330 feet or 100 meters. The western region of the Sound is shallow and narrow relative to the rest of the water body. The central region is the widest segment of the Sound and can be as deep as 130 feet or 40 meters. The eastern region is the deepest area of the sound with some holes here that are as deep as 330 feet or 100 meters. What forces created the unique coastline and bottom contours of Long Island Sound? As we are about to see, it's a combination of events some that are very old, and some recent phenomena. For starters, 
Let's go way back in time, 200 million years ago. At this ancient time, there was no Long Island Sound. There was not even an Atlantic Ocean. The continents were all joined together. In time, large faults in the Earth's surface appeared and separated the continents. Over millions of years, they slowly moved away from each other and the Atlantic Ocean formed between them. The underlying bedrock in the region is a remnant of this ancient time. Here in New Haven, Connecticut, this exposed rock is from the geological period known as the Triassic period. This rock is some 200 million years old. For us, it is an ancient record of this area at the time of the dinosaurs. Ridges of basalt or volcanic rock speak of a climate very different from what we know now. As the ocean grew, rivers ran out of what we now call New England, carrying sediments to the coast. This is known as the Cretaceous period, when thick layers of this sediment built up to form the foundation upon which Long Island itself would be built. At about 50 million years ago, some of these rivers carved a deep river valley. This river valley became what is now Long Island Sound. But the region was to undergo many more changes before Long Island Sound, as we now know it, was to appear. The most visible imprint on this area was from a geologic event 20,000 years ago. To us, a very long time in the past, but in terms of geologic history, it is like it happened yesterday. Imagine Long Island Sound 20,000 years ago, when this area was completely covered in ice as thick as 1,000 feet. Immense glaciers extending all the way across Canada and covering the highest mountains in New York and New England encroached all the way south to Long Island. The movement of these glaciers helped to create the different coastlines of the Sound which we saw on our tour, the rocky coast of Connecticut and the sandy coast of Long Island. As the glaciers slowly moved across the continent, it scraped sand, stone, and sediment from the land. This scraping action exposed the many large rocks we now see on the Connecticut coastline. The glacier also gouged out deep impressions in the land, which were later flooded with seawater and became the many harbors of Connecticut. Geologists believe that sand and sediment is moved by a glacier much like it would be moved by a massive conveyor belt. It picks up the loose materials at one point and deposits it at another. In the case of this glacier, it picked up sand, sediment, and loose rock from what is now New England and Connecticut and deposited it on what is now Long Island. The sand deposited by the glacier is called outwash sand and it helped create the sandy beaches of Long Island. The small rocks on Long Island also have a smoothness which sets them apart from the rugged character of rocks on Connecticut's shoreline. This again is due to the glacier whose conveyor-like motion scraped and scoured rocks under great pressure before leaving them behind on Long Island. The leading edge of sand and gravel, called a moraine, was deposited on Connecticut and Long Island. There are two moraines on Long Island, the Harbor Hill Moraine and the Ronkonkoma Moraine. The Harbor Hill Moraine runs along the northern shoreline of Long Island. The top layer of the sandy bluffs we saw on our tour are actually the eroded side of this moraine. 
the Ronkonkoma Moraine forms what might be considered the backbone of Long Island. It is theorized that when the glacier stopped, it left behind the Ronkonkoma Moraine. Later, the movement of the ice paused again, leaving the Harbor Hill Moraine. Fragments of other moraines survive as small islands in the Sound, like the Norwalk Islands off the coast of Connecticut. But about 12 to 15,000 years ago, the temperature of the Earth began to rise again and melt this glacial cap. This slowly released massive volumes of water worldwide. As the glaciers receded, the world's oceans began to rise and the Sound River Valley filled with fresh water. But the Sound River Valley was not yet connected to the sea. It was filled with a series of freshwater lakes. At about 10,000 years ago, the level of the seas rose to the point where the Atlantic Ocean inundated the Sound Lakes. Long Island Sound then became what we now recognize it to be, an arm of the Atlantic Ocean. Sea level continued to rise, which over time flooded the low-lying coastal areas. Today, the sea continues to rise up and claim more of the shoreline. Connected to the Atlantic Ocean, Long Island Sound has been and is today influenced by the strong tides of the sea. The sand dunes on the bottom of the Sound are caused by these strong tides. Coming through the eastern end of the Sound, tides of up to four knots sweep sand into these large underwater dunes. This connection to the ocean has another important consequence for the character of Long Island Sound. The influx of salty sea water from the ocean and fresh water coming from the rivers which empty into the Sound classifies the Sound as an estuary. And the position of its major source of fresh water, the Connecticut River, makes Long Island Sound an unusual estuary. Most estuaries, like Delaware Bay, for example, have their major source of fresh water at the head of the water body and the opening to the ocean at the mouth. Long Island Sound has two connections to the ocean, one at the eastern and one at the western end, and its primary source of fresh water, the Connecticut River, is near the mouth. The Connecticut River contributes approximately 72% of all fresh water entering the Sound. The other two major rivers emptying into the Sound are the Housatonic and the Thames, which are also in Connecticut. This enormous volume of fresh water carries tons of silt and sand with it, which have been washed off the land farther upstream. The mud carried into the Sound gets caught up in the estuarine circulation. Much of this sediment gets carried along to the central and western regions of the Sound and settles out unto the bottom. This explains the large mud plains on the bottom of the central and western regions of the Sound. Over time, enormous volumes of mud have accumulated here. This has important environmental consequences for the Western Sound as well. Many troublesome contaminants, like lead and PCBs, are attached to these mud particles and are trapped in the sediment of Western Long Island Sound. The muddy floor of the Western and Central Sound is still slowly building up. It takes some 50 years to add another inch to this muddy layer. Does that mean that one day Long Island Sound will fill up with mud? No, because there is another factor that prevents this from happening. The rise in sea level caused by the melting of the glaciers is still happening today. In fact, 
It is estimated that the level of the sea has risen 400 feet since the end of the last ice age. Sea level increases about one inch every 10 years. So even as layer after thin layer of mud is deposited in the central and western regions, the sound is still getting deeper. And it may get deeper even faster in the future. Human activity is inadvertently changing our atmosphere. Scientists believe that these changes will make the world a little warmer, the so-called greenhouse effect. As this happens, the polar ice caps will melt, which will accelerate sea level rise around the world. The global oceans will also become warmer, which will cause the water to expand, another factor which will increase the rise in sea level worldwide. It isn't a change one would easily notice, however. It will still take about five to seven years to raise the level of Long Island Sound just one inch. Now we know Long Island Sound a little better. The many harbors and rivers of Connecticut. The long, unbroken shoreline of eastern Long Island. We also know a little about the history of the Sound, how the Sound River carved out the basin for Long Island Sound how the glaciers created the hilly moraines of Long Island and off the coast of Connecticut. And now we've seen what causes the huge muddy plain on the bottom of the Western Sound and the sand dunes of the Eastern Sound. We know a little about the influence of Connecticut's rivers. And we know just where in the world is Long Island Sound. We also know that Long Island Sound is constantly changing. Even as we watch this program, waves continue to pound upon the shore, taking sand from one part of the coastline and depositing it at another. The wind and the rain erode tall sand bluffs, dumping more sand and dirt into the sound, perhaps adding yet another layer of mud on the bottom. And the level of the sound is slowly rising, so slowly that to us it is virtually imperceptible. But in the world of nature, which is often measured in terms of thousands, if not millions of years, these changes can be seen from a different perspective. With a look far, far into the future, Long Island Sound may be very different from what it is today. This estuary, which we've now come to know better, may be much bigger someday, or perhaps the glaciers may return, putting an end to the long life of Long Island Sound. <laughs>